Welcome to Haunted Talks, the official podcast of The Haunted Walk, offering thematic walking tours in Kingston, Ottawa, and Toronto, Ontario. My name is Jim Dean. I am the creative director of the company, and we really appreciate you joining us for today's episode. Over the past month, I've been following a news story from Phoenix, Arizona. A group there, known as the Satanic Temple, were scheduled to lead the opening prayer or invocation before a Phoenix City Council meeting. When this was announced, a lot of steps were taken to try to stop this group from doing so. For many of us, when we do hear the word Satanism or a Satanist, I think there are a lot of negative connotations. We think about things that are ritualistic, dark, scary, unsettling. What I found, though, is I began reading more and more news articles on the situation, and in particular reading the statements and the quotes from the group, is that there seemed to be quite a divide between what people think Satanists are and what the group is actually saying. I reached out to the Arizona chapter head of the Satanic Temple, Stu DeHaan, and asked him to be on the show so he could talk to us a bit about what Satanism is, so we get a clear picture right from the source, and also to talk a little bit about the political situation in Phoenix, how the events unfolded there, and a little bit about kind of free speech in the U.S. in general. And to be honest, this might be the most compelling interview we have done to date. Just before we get to the interview, I wanted to let you know our 2016 season has begun. Tours are now running currently every weekend in Kingston, Ottawa, and Toronto. So we'd love to have you out to join us for a tour. And remember, if there's an evening we don't have a particular tour you're interested in doing, please give us a call if you have a group of five or more and we'll do our best to try to add that to the schedule. And now, my interview with a Satanist. Joining us today is Stu DeHaan. He's an attorney with his own practice in Tucson, Arizona. He's also the guitarist for Scar Eater, a post-hardcore metal band. I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, But more importantly, perhaps for our conversation today, he is also the chapter head of the Satanic Temple in Arizona. Stu, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I got to say, this is the first time we've had a guest on the show that has been described as both evil and like ISIS in the same breath by an elected official. So uh, just want to say for the record, you've been very accommodating with us, very generous with your time, and uh, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. (laughs) All right. I must admit, though, it was a little interesting when I began to talk to some of my colleagues here at the Haunted Walk, who are a fairly open-minded group, obviously, you know, we tell ghost stories for a living, that when I told them I'd be speaking to a Satanist, I did see the concern almost in some of their eyes as I was telling them this. So today, what I'd really love to do is kind of break down what has been happening uh, in Phoenix with the city council, and also, I guess, in general, to maybe shed a little light on what Satanism is or is not and, you know, and, and how that all works. Does it sound reasonable? Yeah. Sounds good. So from, from my understanding, when uh, the city council in Phoenix has a meeting, every meeting opens with a prayer or invocation, which could be, you know, done by a variety of different people from different faiths, including atheists, I understand, have, have led the invocation before as well. Uh, so you, as a member of the Satanic Temple, you know, basically put in the paperwork so that you could, you know, when the turn came up, you could lead the invocation. And that was scheduled for February 17th. And then, to, to pardon the pun, it seems like all hell has broken loose <laughs> in the meantime. So I'm wondering if, to start, you could maybe read us today the invocation as you wish, wish to present it. Um, this was actually an invocation that uh, someone from the Satanic Temple did before, um, which one of the funny things about the situation is no one bothered to look it up. Um, it was published online, and nobody really cared to try to see what we were actually going to do. Um, I even directed people to it. So, I mean, it was, it was very clear as this as situation was unfolding that no one really cared to understand us. They just wanted to condemn us immediately. Uh, would you like me to read it to you? That'd be great, yeah, if you could share it with us. Sure. It goes as follows. Let us stand now, unbowed and unfettered by arcane doctrines born of fearful minds in darkened times. Let us embrace the Luciferian impulse to eat of the tree of knowledge and dissipate our blissful and comforting delusions of old. 
Let us demand that individuals be judged for their concrete actions, not their fealty to arbitrary social norms and illusory categorizations. Let us reason our solutions with agnosticism in all things, holding fast only to that which is demonstrably true. Let us stand firm against any and all arbitrary authority that threatens the personal sovereignty of one or, or all. That which will not bend must break, and that which can be destroyed by truth should never be spared its demise. It is done. Hail Satan. What jumps out to me at first is this seems, if we take the word Satan out of this or Satanist out of this, if you just had these written down on a sheet of paper in front of you, it seems like most people would agree with this general philosophy. It's a very reasonable philosophy. In fact, it's based on logic and reason, and it shuns superstition and supernatural. That's the entire point of Satanism. As you know, Satan obviously is a very polarizing figure and kind of the um, the, the antichrist like character, the the opposite of 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 Christianity. Certainly, does when you when you say "Hail Satan" at the end. Are you really appealing to a supernatural deity then, or why specifically use the word uh, Satan if you're not? Um, what Satan represents, uh, it, to us it's our metaphor, and what Satan represents is the ultimate rebel, uh, the eternal rebel against tyranny, autocracy, and oppression. And it, it's, he's such the rebel that he even uh, rebels against God himself, and that is our religion. We rebel against any establishment that's oppressive in any way, uh, all the way up to God. And that's what Satan represents. Um, it is a religion, and, and, and the way I've been describing it is, uh, you know, I think, I think Westerners in general in the Western world are kind of stuck in this mentality that religion equals monotheism. We all praise the one almighty God in general, and that goes for Islam, uh, Christianity, Judaism, pretty much has those concepts. But, you know, there's other religions that don't have that. There's plenty of uh, polytheistic religions that worship multiple gods. And then there's uh, religions like Buddhism, where Buddha is not a deity or a god, it's more of a path to enlightenment. And that's kind of what Satanism is. It's We believe that it is our absolute sacred duty to resist tyranny in, in every sense. Um, and, and we live by a set of tenets. We do not believe in the supernatural. We do not believe in uh, superstition. And it is, it is a path of pure truth and reason and believing in yourself and things that are that are earthly, we don't believe in an afterlife. We must make the best of what we have now and here. And that's pretty much the general gist of what Satanism is. And how does this philosophy appear in your day-to-day life? <laughs> well, me personally, I mean, I, not, not to get too biographical, but I mean, I, even in my career as a criminal defense attorney, I mean, I fight the government for a living. Um, in my past, I've been involved in, in uh, activism. I've been involved in some certain anarchist groups and communist groups and kind of anti-establishment type uh, things. So to me, this was a natural extension of that. Um, and, and frankly, it's been the most effective activism I've been involved with. Plus, I absolutely agree and live by the tenants. Um, you know, one of the tenants is if you make a mistake, correct it and correct any harm that you've done. I, I think that's a very important way to live. Part, part of Satanism has never harmed the innocent but don't give too much compassion to the ingrate. Meaning, you know, don't, don't love the unworthy if they're nothing to you but psychic vampires. Meaning all they do is take and they don't give anything back to you. That's not worth it in your life. There, there, there are things like that that are involved in Satanism. And recently you've become head of the, the Arizona chapter of the Satanic Temple. If, uh, if we or the listeners were to, to come to one of your meetings, I assume you have meetings or uh, s- ceremonies. I'm not sure what the, what the best word would be, but I'd be interested to hear kind of like, what, what do you do uh, at, at these meetings? And, you know, what would one expect if they attended? <laughs> well, we're a brand new chapter. We just got our charter last week. <laughs> so um, I could tell you what some of the things we intend on doing. One of the things we want to do is a reading group where we kind of explore things like the Satanic Bible. Um, there's a new book that came out that's more of a historical context called The Invention of Satanism, and essentially talks about how this entire concept was born out of witch hunts and false accusations. And that's why we use this symbol and, it is, and this metaphor, is because it represents things that are unnecessarily and arbitrarily hated by the establishment. And it's a very powerful image to us, the Baphomet, um, which represents the Knights Templar, their, their false idol they're accused of worshiping, which was complete, it was completely false. They were actually burned at the stake over this, and that's our symbol, is 
um, the symbol of the accusation, the false accusation against these people. So those are the kind of the things we discuss. Um, we're planning on going through the Satanic Bible, which is essentially a great self-help book. <laughs> um, and then we have a lot of activities planned, such as we're, we're going to do some charity work. Um, we might adopt a, a highway. Um, we're going to do some work with animals. There's some. There's a, a black cat rescue um, that we might get involved with. And there's other things that are kind of stuff that in the Satanist cause, you know, we kind of help out the things that are shunned the things that have a bad connotation to people and, and always un- unjustly or unnecessarily. And that's kind of the things that we're looking to do. Speaking of, of unjust accusation, I read a, a number of the comments connected with the various new, news articles you've been in over the past few weeks. And the way you were described by some is extremely shocking, I would say, in particular by those who represent themselves as, as Christians and being being familiar with that ideology, the way you've been treated by some of these individuals, mm-hmm. I, I think, is, is somewhat ironic. But one of the the statements that appeared several times was this concept that you are evil for being a Satanist. Would you Would you like an opportunity to address that directly? Well, it's it's easy. It's it's low hanging fruit. I mean, this is you know we we realize and we expect some resistance as the metaphor that we choose to to live by is the representative of evil in, in Christian, mostly Christian culture. So, I mean, we expect some of this backlash, but what's happened, and you can see, which is exactly our intent, is how much we draw out the bigots and how much we draw out the unintelligent. And, you know, this guy, uh, your voice, who you're referring to is Sal DeCicio, who's the Phoenix City Council member, and fully acknowledged he knows nothing about us, refuses to know anything about us, and he takes this great pride in ignorance, which is be kind of become an evangelical American thing where they take absolute great stalwart pride in not knowing what they're talking about um, because they want to go on assumption. Um, I think he's a panderer. He's a tribal panderer. Um, he admits that he's not a lawyer over and over. And every time we explain the law to him, he ignores it because he wants to just stand by this pretty idiotic concept of what good and evil is to the point where he compared us to a hate or terrorist group not even reading the tenets, not even listening to anything we have to say. So what we've done is we've drawn him out. We've shown to the public that he is incompetent, um, that he's unintelligent, that he is representing the city, making laws, not even understanding or grasping extremely basic constitutional law. And he also made a vote that if that passed, he would have opened them up to a lawsuit, the entire city, where the city attorney advised him not to do that. And he, the city attorney told him that we would have won. And he did that anyway. So he's inept, he's incompetent, um, and this, these are the kind of people we kind of draw out, and we want to show everybody, look, this is your government. They're discriminatory, and they're not very bright. So, you know, he kind of, you know, showed himself. All we had to do was sign up, and he brought it, and he drew himself out and showed the world what, what he's about. I'd like to move on to kind of the ramifications with city council and how that unfolded in a moment. But maybe a final question before we get there is, you mentioned this is kind of uh, Satanism uh, is kind of a metaphorical way uh, th- that you live your lives. So I guess a, a question I would have would be, how do we, how you do, do you make that definition between a kind of political action and religion? It, it's, it's definitely both. But I mean, it, here, here's what's interesting about religion. Um, you know, if you're in our position, we don't believe any God exists. So we think the Christian God is false, but Islamic God is false. We think none of this stuff exists, but we acknowledge that they're all religions. So to us, the, the, what we call is the left-hand path, and that is, that is the way to live life that, is, that doesn't rely on these things. It doesn't rely on having to be a moral person because of fear of the afterlife. Uh, you know, fear of, of internal damnation is, is the only thing that drives you to be a good person. We think that's absolutely ridiculous. Um, so as far as it being a religion, what we see other religions are is they follow a set of tenets or commandments or whatever it is that they have. Um, and we believe that everyone's free to do that and they should do that. Um, in that they follow a certain set of rituals that they do, whether they worship in a church or have certain types of prayer or certain kinds of trappings that they use candles, religious icons. We have all of that. Um, so being that we don't believe in any of their gods, including our own, which <laughs> puts us all on the equal ground. So it is absolutely a religion to us. And 
one of the things that's interesting is a lot of people kind of try to make us justify how this is a religion, which is really funny because if we were to do that to everyone else, you know, we, everybody thinks everyone else's concepts are ridiculous and that's why they follow their own. So there, there's no real difference between us and other religions. Just so we can set the record absolutely straight, because there's the Hollywood depiction, I think, of, of Satanism, which involves things like drinking of blood, virgin sacrifices, really nefarious kind of creepy things. But you're, what you're telling us is basically there's none of that. We get to, together to share this philosophy, uh, which is very empathetic, very rational, and you choose to live your lives in that way. Is that is that correct? That's pretty much correct. But there there is a ritual aspect, especially to some of the older um, Satanist concepts. Like for instance, Levan with the Church of, of Satan. What he was doing was essentially a mockery. So what the priests would do in the old days would, would pretty much lay out this essentially pornographic set of things that Satanists supposedly did, which the way, the way LeVay saw it was that was the priest getting themselves off, essentially, by writing this pornographic material. So in that Satanism, the ritual was to mock that. It's like, if you want to do it that way, you'd be mocking what they think we do. So there's a lot of mockery towards the, the establishment that's clearly... Per, whose purpose is clearly just to control people and to scare people. So yeah, if there there are satanic rituals that that involve that kind of thing, you know, the, the satanic temple doesn't really get into that aspect of it. But one of the main tenets of all Satanist culture is never harm the innocent, never never harm any living creature is what we have in the satanic temple. So as far as sacrificial stuff, that's church scare tactics. That's what we rebel against. If you if you convince people there's this evil out there, you will scare them. And fear is the name of the game nowadays. Everything, especially in the United States, everything is based on fear. That's how the government drives people to do things, is to scare them, to convince them of their own legitimacy. So that's one of the reasons this metaphor is so powerful, because we don't obey it. Let's move ahead then, uh, in kind of the chronology of how this was unfolding in Phoenix. You had uh, gotten your date that you were going to be going to be leading the invocation again, a two minute uh, presentation, which you've already given us and all, all hell breaks loose and an emergency meeting is held, which seems like essentially to find some way to prevent you folks uh, from doing this. Were you at the emergency meeting yourself? No, uh, there's no way we could logistically get there. For one reason, it was an emergency meeting. So it happened very quickly after they called for it. Um, and Michelle Short and I, She's my colleague in this. We, we just couldn't get up there, but we all watched it streaming online. Uh, people all over the country were watching it, as it turns out. I had a lot of people contact me, even in Canada, um, saying that they were watching it live, and it was absolutely medieval. I mean, it, it was exactly as you would imagine something in the 1700s to go down. It was extremely, extremely passionate debate. And I'm wondering if you could for us, for the sake of argument, as, as an attorney, what is the what is the argument the other side was trying to make to prevent you from doing this, just so we understand? Sure. Sure. So here's what they did. Um, the first thing that happened is the incompetent psychic vampire, Sal DeCicio, made a statement all across Twitter on, and on TV that he is going to enact a measure to specifically discriminate against the religious group, which is what essentially he said by blocking us. We're going to do everything we can to stop them. And I'm sitting here going, is he insane that he just set up a lawsuit for us? Um, so then they, they enacted two measures or attempted to. The first one was a residency restriction saying these people are from Tucson. We're a city council in Phoenix. Um, they shouldn't be allowed to give the invocation, which already is illegal because it's, uh, it's a violation of uh, equal protection clause. You don't have to be in one city or another to exercise First Amendment rights. Not to mention, does he think we don't have people in Phoenix? <laughs> like there's only two of us in the state. And then the second one was he was trying to make it so for every invocation, they needed a specific city council member to approve it or sponsor it. Therefore, what he was trying to do was trying to be able to claim his opponents in the city council we're in, in league with the Satanists, because if anyone allowed us to do it, he could actually say that. So that was a political ploy on his, on his um, part. Now, again, you'd end up in the same situation, because if we petitioned each individual city council member to sponsor us, and every single one was like, I'm not touching this, we're back in the exact same spot with a lawsuit. So even if they enacted it, um, they would have lost in court. Now, 
what they did not count on was there was an already constitutional violation built into this because they wanted to apply it retroactively. So essentially pull the rug from under us, um, which the city, the city attorney said, if you enact this in an emergency, it has to apply forward because if it applies backwards, they've got yet another claim against us. Um, <laughs> so then another city council member made a, a second emergency motion saying in the alternative, let's shut down the whole program, have a moment of silence. No one gets the, no one gets to play anymore. Game over for everyone. That's how much we want to discriminate against them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the, I think one of the key legal decisions you're referencing, obviously you'd be the expert and not me, but was that about two years ago, the Supreme Court kind of ruled in favor of prayer as being protected free speech. However, there was a, a, a proviso in the ruling which said, so long as a town maintains a policy of non-discrimination, the Constitution does not require it to search beyond its borders for non-Christian prayer givers in an attempt to achieve religious balancing. So I take right. it, is, it is your position that they are obviously acting in a discriminatory fashion. Not only is it obvious, they said it. They said it out loud to the news. We're discriminating against them. That's what we're trying to do. That's our entire purpose of doing this. And I'm, I, it was unbelievable that they were doing that because that's, that's just saying they want to get sued because they're suppressing a religious minority. The fact that they were that blind to that is just unacceptable as a, as a politician, that they don't understand that. And the, the decision you're referring to is, was, uh, it was the town of Greece v. Galloway. Um, and yeah, you're right. What it says is you can't instate a policy for the specific purpose of discrimination. And they said that's what they were doing. That was the purpose of the emergency meeting was to discriminate against us. <laughs> so by that law, by that uh, Supreme Court case law, we would have we would have had solid ground. But also the the second part you're referring to said they don't need to look outside of their borders to find people. It doesn't say people from other places can't come. It says if they want to pray every time and they run out of people, you know, they don't have to go searching for it. I think that's pretty much what that meant. So I think that was misinterpreted by a bunch of people too. It's really fascinating to us in Canada because certainly one of the things we know about the United States, which Americans, I believe, take a great deal of pride in, is the idea of the separation between church and state. But it sounds like what you're experiencing is the separation of church and state so long as it's a particular kind of church. It's bigotry. We have a policy of bigotry in this country that the Satanic Temple is exposing, because it's not just us. Then that was part of my argument. I said, look, if you don't if people don't pay attention to this, we don't know whose voice is going to be silenced next. We're an easy target. We're an easy target because of our name and our metaphor. But I'm like, this isn't just going to apply to us. If you look at all the other speeches that were given, I think 99% were Judeo-Christian. I don't know how many groups petitioned and they, and they just said no and, and nothing happened. But my group has a sacred duty to resist. Another of the arguments the other side was making was an appeal to tradition that the idea that the city council has been doing this for 50 years, and it kind of violates something uh, primal uh, about kind of the the way of life there. But I, I can't imagine that argument is overly convincing for you as well, for the reasons just mentioned. Well, you just said it. Appeal to tradition is actually a, a logical fallacy by definition. Um, one of the worst things, and especially in law, one of the worst things you can argue is, well, this is the way it should be done because this is the way it's always been done. It is the weakest argument you could ever give in any logical scenario. Um, so, you know, this is, this is what's happening is we have a bunch of people in the government with what we're calling atrophied minds. They've literally never had to think about this. This has never come up to them. And this is the first time something in this context came up that they didn't uh, agree with. And they had a complete literal meltdown, people crying crying at the podium over this because they never had to deal with it and they don't even see how discriminatory they are. And what's your thoughts then on the final decision that was made? So they're going to suspend prayer entirely before the council meetings. They're now going to have a moment of kind of silent re reflection or personal prayer, if you will. Is this, how, how do you find that solution? Because in some ways, given your political position, this may in fact be the best result in that prayer is taken out of it entirely. Um, that's one way to look at it. Um, a lot of people are accusing us of, 
of this was our goal in the first place, which is also ironic. Another layer of irony is we never asked for that. We have no control over that. They pulled the plug. We had nothing to do with that. Um, now, a lot of people will argue, well, this is the best way because now these disputes can't come up, which is true. They had one of two legal routes they could take. They could let us speak or they could shut down the whole thing. Now, I think it's a little unfortunate because you know we have no problem with the prayer at the city council as long as they include everybody. So we didn't ask for that. Um, also, I think they're immense cowards. They were so determined, so hell-bent, so to speak, in, <laughs> to discriminate against us that they took it away from everyone else. And I think that is exceptionally cowardly. Along those lines, I was maybe not surprised, and maybe that's what saddens me, is that the Republican Party is now threatening to try to recall the members of city council who voted for the moment of silence, as if that's some type of... Mm-hmm grand transgression and that's that's so difficult to believe that's a witch hunt that's exactly what that is they must be in league with the dark side we must recall them i mean this is just showing this is exactly what our group is about is to show that this stuff is real but there was a there was a point that was the most shocking to me when sal decisio accused the city of attorney the city attorney of being in league with us <laughs> and that he rigged the system the city attorney he accused him of that. This is how crazy this has gotten. I mean, this is this is why I'm calling it medieval. It's like an old 1600s witch hunt. Now, I understand there is some good news for your organization in that Scottsdale, Arizona, is going to have... Uh, I mean, is it going to be yourself or someone else from uh, the Satanic Temple who's actually going to give the invocation there? Um, we've had this... this uh, the way we've set this up since the beginning is um, I'm doing a lot of the talking as far as um, the legalities of the situation, but... As far as the actual giving of the invocation, it's uh, Michelle Short, um, who's also from Tucson, and she's also uh, a member of the Satanic Temple. She's a chapter head with me. She's the one that's going to be physically giving the invocation. But both of us together are are working on all of these things. Now, as far as Scottsdale, you know, we might not receive flack until the very last minute, or we might walk in the door, give our invocation, and walk out. And we have no idea how it's going to turn out, because what happened in Phoenix was definitely unexpected. And what date is that scheduled for? Is there a date yet? There, it was scheduled originally for early April, but since it's out of town for us, we might have some logistical issues with that. Um, so I'm saying that at this point it's tentative, but they did clear us to do it. So what's the way forward here? Obviously, from what you're saying, is that you do want to respect other people's ability to believe in uh, religion, gods, you really have no issue with that at all. Uh, at the same time, as you, as we've said here, people are reacting very emotionally, very irrationally, I would think. What would you suggest as a way to kind of bring these two sides together in, in, in more of a, a common partnership kind of fashion? They need to open their minds. I mean, this, that's all that this comes down to. People need to, if, if this is something that's very important to them, and prayer and religion, they really need to try to understand other people's prayers and religions. Because without that, there's going to be this constant stalemate. And then when you have this stalemate, people's exercise, free exercise of religion will be hindered, and they'll also hinder themselves by taking the prayer out of the public forum that they wanted in the first place. So the way I see it, if they just try to look into what we're doing, try to look in the mirror and have a little introspection about what they're doing, I, I think that could really help. <laughs> but I think that concept could be said in a lot of different contexts. I do wonder, is there anything to be said for the fact, I guess, of removing the name Satan or Satanic from the description of who you are or, or what you're about? Understanding there is some uh, historical links and connection and tradition, I guess, to that side of it as well. I can understand, at least on an initial response level, that you are claiming to represent the anti-hero, essentially, of a particular religion. Have you given any thought to, to changing the name to kind of do away with the religious connection altogether and just to stand for more of the core values, you know, the empathy, the understanding, uh, the rationality? Is there a way you could do that without kind of invoking such an emotional response? Or is that even fair to ask you? Well, it's part of it. Plus, that's what we are. We're saying this. We're not something else. And we refuse to change our beliefs, our ideology, or our metaphor based on other people's fear. That's really all the questions I have for you today, Stu. If people are interested in finding out more about the Satanic Temple or what's happening in Scottsdale, is there somewhere you could direct them? 
Um, we just launched our Facebook page yesterday, actually. So um, if you look up Satanic Temple on Facebook, um, I don't think we have a Twitter feed yet, but th- they'll have a list of chapters, and, and the Arizona chapter just opened. Um, we're very active right now because we're kind of in the midst of this this campaign. We're calling it the Invocation Campaign. And in fact, there was a hashtag that came up called PrayerGate um, based on this situation on Twitter. So <laughs> I don't know if that's still going, but that might be another way. Um, also, Michelle Short and I are very accessible. Um, we like to talk about this. We enjoy it. We're trying to get our voices heard and kind of help people understand what we're about. And if you know, we're not here to recruit or convert. We have no interest in that. But if people are interested, we will we will talk to as many people as possible. Is there anything you don't believe we've covered yet today? Do you think would be important for folks to know? Just that we're Satanists and we're your friends, Stu. I really appreciate you joining us today. A very interesting conversation. As I said, I think there's a lot of different ideas out there about what Satanists are. So to actually speak to one and to hear from one today, I think will be extremely rewarding to our audience. Thank you so much for making the time for us. No problem at all. And that was my interview with Stu DeHaan. A big thank you to Stu for making the time, answering those questions. I thought it was a really interesting and thought-provoking discussion. If you're enjoying our podcast, we'd love to get a five-star review from you on iTunes or your podcast catcher of choice, and be sure to subscribe to the show so you know when the new episodes are coming out. Until we meet again, sweet dreams.